and, and uh, everybody else that's joining. We're going to be um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is, we've been going through the last few weeks, we've been going through 2 Timothy. And so this has been uh, just, a, just a real joy to go through. Um, so what I'd like to do is just have a word of prayer and then we'll just spend a few moments in uh, chapter 3 verses 1 to 9. And we'll see what God has for us, but uh, let, me, let me pray for us. Father, thank you that we can come, that we can uh, we can get into your word, that we can get here in, in here outside. We're able to get back together. The weather is, is holding up, and it's just such a beautiful day, and we give you all the glory and all the credit for it. Father, I thank you that we can uh, we can get into your word um, while we, we treasure nature. Lord, your word shows us the creator of nature and the purpose of nature, and that is to glorify you and and to um, just to display your glory to, to everyone that's on the earth. Father, I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that are watching by Facebook Live. Um, we need these times together because the, the days are just, it feels like the days are just drawing to a close, and we need to have a sense of urgency about us. So thank you, Lord, for giving us 2 Timothy. If there's a book in the Bible that's about urgency, it's this book. Thank you, Father, for bringing us here. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before we get into 2 Timothy 3, just to kind of catch up and let you know what 2 Timothy is all about. 2 Timothy is the last book that we have from the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to young Pastor Timothy, young missionary Timothy, as he is going about planting a church and helping to establish a church in Ephesus. And while we don't know how much time there was between when the Apostle Paul closed and you know finished doing 2 Timothy and when he was actually executed, we do know and we have a sense of urgency that the Apostle Paul was, one, wanting Timothy to make sure that he was getting the gospel right. Two, that he was making sure that Timothy was being a man of God, a full character. And if you get into 2 Timothy 2, you see that Timothy is one who is, he's using the metaphor of being a good soldier, being a good athlete that, that, that is disciplined and goes according to the rules, being a good farmer, that you're making sure that you're taking care of business the way that you are. All of those metaphors are coming in and really making sure that Paul is wanting Timothy to get it right, to make sure that after Paul's gone, that he's carrying on well. You start getting into, into this later on, and Paul is reminding Timothy that there are going to be people that are going to come into the church that are going to look like they're very, very faithful. And in fact, they're really good imitators. They really know how to look like and, and to do the part. He gives some examples from the Old Testament about what that looks like and what those imitators can look like. And we have to make sure that we have a grid because if, the, if, if Timothy didn't know what the gospel was and didn't know what good character was all about, then he would not be able to know and to be able to discern what some of these false teachers and these false Christians really, Christians, would be looking like. There has to be a grid that we're going by. And so by the time we get into uh, chapter 3, we talk, we see here, well, let's just, let me just go through it bit by bit. Actually, I'll maybe just read the whole thing, then we'll go through it bit by bit. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. So, 
when, he, when Paul is talking about the last days, we have to make sure we're getting our terminology right because when we sometimes talk about the last days, I think we are thinking about that we're getting really close to the Lord's return. But when you're reading the New Testament and they're talking about the last days, what they're talking about is that period from Christ's first, return, first coming to his return, from his first coming to his second coming. So even in Paul's day, that was the last days. Now, we can do the math. There's been a lot of time that's gone by since those last days that, was, that Paul was talking about in New Testament times. Well, now we're how much closer are we? Well, we're 2,000 years. We're two millennia closer to that. Now, will Christ come back next year or in the next 10 or in the next 100? You know, we don't know. There may be a long time. But what we do know is that, and I believe there's a case for it that Jesus is making, is that things will end up amping up fairly quickly as Christ's return comes It comes to more fruition. Now, in 2 Peter 3, it talks about how there were scoffers in that day because Jesus is delaying his second return. When we say delaying, that's by our perspective. God always has a timetable and the right timetable about when things are going to happen. But in our perspective, you think, well, Jesus is going to come back right away, or at least in their perspective, I should say. And in our perspective, we may be thinking, wow, we're having some things going on right now. Well, of course, it's just around the corner. But we have to realize there's always been persecution against Christians and it's always looked like that and we have to make sure that when we're talking about persecutions against Christians we're not talking about mere inconveniences you know being backed up at the gas station that's not persecution that's an inconvenience a persecution means you're living out your faith and someone is coming against you because of your faith Jesus said that that would happen it, through many tribulations we would enter the kingdom of God but one of the challenges that's being talked about here, it says, but in these last days, there will come times of difficulty. And what he's talking about is difficulty for the church and difficulty in the church. Because as we've talked about here, and I'm going to jump ahead, if, if, if you don't mind, to verse 6, where it's talking about um, after Paul goes through these 18 different attributes of what a fake believer is and what a fake believer looks like. I say believer. I hate these 80s air quotes, but believer. That's what they look like. But it's talking about that among them are those who creep into household and capture uh, capture weak women. These are women that work at home, um, and, and, they're, and they're just ones that are, in that time, especially susceptible, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. What we're seeing here is they're always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. In other words, they're a part of the body of Christ and they're continually hearing the word of God, but they're not arriving because there's something inside them that is not right. And what's inside them is they are lovers of self. They're all about themselves and they don't want to be a part of any kind of truth that does not affirm what they are already about. And listen, we can think, well, that's terrible that, it go, that it's like that, but can't we be like that? Don't we sometimes get upset at, at, at people or preachers or something? I mean, I've, I've been on the receiving end of that, where I would preach something from the Bible, and yet someone would say, wait a minute, uh, I, I, I've always thought it was this, and I'm like, well, no, I'm just trying to show you from here. I mean, something very, very clear. We have to be very careful that we're ready. Christians want to change. They want to be ones where God is moving and working in them that if anything is wrong, if anything is off, we welcome the word of God to come in and set us right. We're not going to resist that. We're saying, Lord, bring it on. If there's something that doesn't belong to you and there's something that's not right, bring it on. I want to be more like you. I don't want you to affirm me. I want, to, I want my life to affirm you. Now, Janus and Jambres, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. It could be Janus and Jambres. I, I don't really know. But these are the actually, but tradition tells us that these are actually the two Egyptian magicians that were kind of going toe-to-toe -to -toe before Pharaoh with Moses. Now, do you remember that time where Moses would come and would do a miracle, you know, throw the staff on the ground, and wow, that looked really good, while well, those other guys would do the same thing? It was, it was kind of like this, is that these were people who were imitators of the people and the men of God 
who are preaching the word and who are telling about these prophecies and such. And so just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. This is hard for us, I believe, to, to deal with because when, when someone is, is in the church and even if we see behavior that may not be according to what God's word has to say, you know, we struggle with saying something about it. Now, I could, I could, normally, I'm so used to having a, a conversation on these Wednesday nights. I will do my best to try to hear what you have to say. But why do you think that even if we see people in the church that may not, you know, maybe if you go back to the previous paragraph at the end of 2 Timothy 2, real quarrelsome, real, uh, real disruptive regarding the things of God. Even why do you think we sometimes struggle with confronting someone about that type of behavior, e even if the scripture says we're supposed to, why do you think we come along and say, well, that's really hard for me to do? Judge not, lest you be judged. Yeah. And, you know, and there, there, now there is an aspect to it where it's like, yeah, we're sinners. We, we blow it all the time. Well, I don't know about you all. I know, I, I, I mean, I, I know there's just aspects where I know I have to continue to work and I have to continue to be receptive to what God's saying in my life regarding things. But I, and I think if you're honest, you all would, are, are the same way as well. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. We, we think we're being judgmental because we're like, well, I know I'm a, I know I'm a mess, but there's a difference. The difference is when you're convicted of sin, whether it's private sin that no one else knows about or whether it's public sin that everybody knows about or all points on the spectrum, a Christian will be convicted by it and will repent of it. Now, will we always get it right the next time? No, we're in the flesh. Sometimes things pop up and we just act. But there's an aspect of it where it's not, we're not just sorry we got caught or we're not just, oh, I'm a, I apologize that that offended you. That's not an apology. What you're doing is there is an aspect of repentance, not a digging in of, well, that's just how I am. I actually had someone a uh, long time ago, not here, but a long time ago, you know, well, that's just how I am. Or that's just how they are. And what we've got to realize is, no, there's an aspect where there is a protection of the church and there is a, a witness to the community because people see this. And so when you realize these, these are men corrupted in mind, disqualified regarding their faith, verse 9, but they will not get very far for their folly will be what? Plain to all. You're not going to end up looking at this and saying, well, no, no. no pick up on that no they will pick up on it they'll see it and they'll also see well that church doesn't do really much about it and i think that's where this is the sense of urgency that paul had with timothy timothy keep the church pure protect the gospel make sure that your behavior is in, in line with the fruit of the spirit these two men are examples. Well, now what does this look like? Well, we can go back and, I mean, there's lots of different ways. If you go back to verse 2, there's lots of different ways that you could break this up, right? So one of them is, you know, just basically pride. Lover, lover of self, pride. So what, it, what, are we look, what are we looking at here? Verse 2, for people we become lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and abusive. Well, I'll, I'll just stop right there. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and abusive. In other words, it'll get to the point where they love themselves so much, they won't think twice about being abusive or cruel to you. Because they're right. And you're wrong. And they love themselves. Now, what's the great commandment? The great commandment is to love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On these, you know, are all the law and the prophets. Well, so if you're loving self in that, in the way that's being talked about, in in that pride, if you're loving self, that's just taking care of yourself. Loving self, you're number one. You're not going to have room to love God with all you have, 
And you're certainly not going to want or, and you're, or you'll justify away the desire to love your neighbor as yourself. There's not going to be room for it. You love your neighbor as yourself because as you would take care of yourself, so you would turn around and take care of your neighbor. If you see someone in need, you give them the love of Christ and you go about it. So you see this, lovers of money, I need more and more. That's where my security is. Proud, arrogant. Well, then you get into the next part and you see some aspects about how they deal with their own family. I think these all can work together. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, and unappeasable. I know it's in the middle of the verse, but keep in mind those verses weren't there when the scriptures were written. They came about 1,500 years later. Very helpful for us. But still, we just got to keep in mind uh, how these can be broken up. But even at the end of Romans, where it talks about in Romans 1, 124, 126, and 128, where God gave them up, why did he give them up? Because they decided they were not going to be thankful. They were not going to have anything to do with the things of God. They were going to pursue themselves. They were going to worship the things that are here on the earth. We're seeing that coming really to full fruition now. But what ends up happening? It says even at the end, it's the, it, it, it talks about being disobedient to parents and unholy and all of those things at the end of Romans 1. And it talks about not only do they practice those, they actually build up those who do it as well. So it's, a, it's an inversion of that design. Because think about it. Again, everything in our culture right now, every piece of legislation, the wind's coming up, isn't it? <laughs> so we're, we're working on it. But the, um, every, every piece of our culture, every piece of legislation in our culture right now is going against God's design. And, and sometimes we want to kind of kowtow to that in order to, I say we want to, there's a temptation for churches to want to kind of pull back on that in order to be able to connect with the culture. But whatever you win them with, you keep them with. And so we have to be upfront, honest about what is being said here. You know, being disobedient to your parents, I know cartoons make a living on that. I know commercials make a living on that. I know movies, that, that's great. Parents are idiots. The kids are smart. You know, and that's where, you know, and that's an inversion of that design. And it, and it reinforces to the parents, it reinforces to the kids and the culture, this distortion. Disobedient, being, being disobedient to parents, what do they know? This is hilarious. Parents are idiots. But what ends up happening is because they become ungrateful. Now, no, no parent gets it right, but, not, but we don't always get it all wrong either. We go after it. We, we raise them in the, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We do what we can. And this aspect of a heartless or unappeasable, this idea of not being able to, um, the, it's the idea of refusing to have a truce, refusing to have peace. I will constantly be at war at you. There will be no treaty signed. There will be no truce. We're going to continue to go after it. And when you keep reading on, I mean, honestly, all of these are fairly self-explanatory. Um, but I want to jump down to verse 5. Having the appearance of godliness. Right? So what could that look like? Well, they could say all the right things. They could pray all the right prayers. They could, they could know the jargon. They could know the language. They could know how to act in certain places. But, you know, I came across some, something recently, and I wish I had it. In fact, if I had my phone free, I'd be able to tell you. But it was a reminder, and it was a reminder for me, is that anybody can act spiritual, but you find out what the man is is when something doesn't go their way. When something doesn't go their way, then you see the man or the woman, as the case may be. So what, how do we react when something doesn't go our way? Do we keep the mind of Christ? Or do we put on our own mind and just as my dad used to say, have a duck fit. Are you familiar with a duck fit? You put a little baby duck in your hand. You know what that baby duck's going to do? Have a duck fit. Not going to like it. He's going to want his mom. That's the idea. We, we have a little, a little temper tantrum on the spectrum, but we have a temper tantrum. Why didn't this go my way? Why can't anything go my way? Why can't you see the way I want things done? And then it just, you know, off you go. The hard part about this entire passage is what's said at the end of verse 5. 
three words in my version. Your version may have some more words, but basically, what, what is it saying? You avoid them. You, you avoid the, the, these folks. Well, Pastor Matt, that's not very loving. I'd say it is. I, I would contend that it is because you are being loving to the church. You are protecting them from this behavior. You're protecting them from false teachers. You're protecting them from these imitators. And this is where it comes all the way back around to what we talked about at the beginning. The Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that Timothy knew the gospel. If you know what the gospel is, not, you know, not just praying the prayer, but what I'm talking about is you understand what Jesus did, why he had to do it, what the result of it is, and how we're supposed to tell it. It's, it's an understanding of how Christ rescued us from sin, from brokenness, and rescued us back to his design only through Christ, only through the bloody cross, only through the empty tomb. Oh, that's the only way that it can happen. That's, the, that's God's economy. Anything away from that, you're going to have folks come in and like, well, that's a little too hard. You don't have to do it this way. Just do it this way. And it's, it's, it's slight. It's, it's just small. It can be a little tiny drift, little tiny drift. But then over the course of a month, six months, a year, five years, if that drift isn't taken care of, and what's going to happen is we're way over here. And then if a, someone comes in and says, no, we got to be right here. Because the drift has been so, so um, gradual. Then, then if you find yourself over here, someone's trying to say, no, we got to be over here. You're going to be upset at them. They're going to be the troublemakers. Because they're, they're trying to get you back on track. But we've set a different track, and that's where we've got to be really careful. So what, what Paul is showing with this urgency is that there are going to be times when there are going to be things as far as unholy teaching, unrighteous behavior, it's going to have to be addressed. Now, again, this was just next. This was next in 2 Timothy. This, we, you know, those of you that have been coming on Wednesday nights and been checking in, you know, We've been going through First and Second Timothy, and this is this is where we are right now. Um, so be just praying about your role and your understanding when you go and and hear the word of God, when you hear the sermon, when you're hearing a um, a lesson being taught. Just ask God to work. Ask God to work in you. Ask God to make you aware of what He's teaching in His Word, and to give you the strength to be able to follow through and obey. This is a very unnatural thing we're calling people to do. That's why there's a supernatural change that has to take place and to continue to take place in us. Okay? So I want to I want to pull back, see if there's any questions. Um, I'll, I'll, hopefully I can hear you now that that thing's on. My ears are just, they're, they're not right. But if you could help me out, that would be great. Any questions or anything that may have come up um, in this that you'd like to address or you'd like me to go a little deeper into, um, I'll do what I can. Yes. Yes. That, in fact, that was something Wearsby was talking about is, is this talk... He was basically asking a question that he foresaw we would ask. Is this something that's going to happen, or is it something that's, that's present right now? I think what Paul is telling Timothy is they may not be showing it right now, but just be on, be on the lookout. They could, be, it could come up. They could come up. Be aware. Address it as it comes rather than letting it go because then, then you're really having to clean up a mess. Again, these are the hardest conversations to have. Because, I mean, sometimes these folks have been in the church for a long, long time. That's how they've gotten the credibility. They've been in the church. They've been able to kind of work their way in. They know how to, if I can say it this way, they know how to play the game. They know how to use the language. And it's just really 
easy for that to for that to happen. And it's a it's a tendency in every church, if we're not careful, to to see that happen. But we've got to be willing. So you're saying that people would be ah. having the appearance of God. Yes. Yes. Oh, I may I may have missed something. So what this, what this is what I heard you say. They can have the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. You said, but how can they be both? What what are, what are my options here? You said both. Lovers of self, lovers of money. Yes. So they can be both. That's right. So the the way that I would the, the way that I understand it is. If you read through Isaiah 1 or Amos 5, a lot of the prophets were talking about how there would be people that were going through the motions of worship, but they were doing it for selfish reasons. Like they would they would be worshiping because they thought, if I did this, then God's going to bless me. It's prosperity gospel now. If I do this, then God will bless me. So I am worshiping God in order for my own personal self-interest to be met. Or they could come into a church. I mean, this has been, this, this is a tendency everywhere where people can, churches tend to be magnets for those that like control. They, they, they can be magnets for that. And if we're, if we're not careful, because they're so willing to serve, you know, we, they, they, it can go and get really out of hand. But you can want to be someone in the church and want to be a leader in the church because it makes you feel better about yourself and you can exercise influence over other people because it makes you, it builds your, it builds your kingdom up rather than his. So yeah, that's where the prophets came in. It's like, you guys are, you guys are going through all of this and God, God's not going to have anything to do with it because he sees the motives. Yeah. You can be both. But it's a check on us. Instead of us thinking about, well, I know that guy or that person, it's a check on us. What are we after? Are we serving God because we want to glorify him? Or are we serving God because we want him to build us up and make us feel great? Well, he will, but it'll be on his terms as he rescues us from our brokenness and not not as we dig into ourselves. I can keep going, but... (laughs) 